Welcome everyone to a special episode of CRE Exchange. I'm Cole Perry, your host and senior market analyst at Altus Group, leading provider of asset and fund intelligence. I'm joined by Omar El our U.S. Director of Research. Omar, it's good to be with you. Glad to be here. Today, uh, we're excited to share the results of the Q4 Commercial Real Estate Industry Conditions and Sentiment Survey. So I want to tell you a little bit about it before we dive into it, but the survey is really conducted by the Altus Research team across the U.S. and Canada in an effort to provide insights into the market, so conditions, metrics, and issues affecting the CRE industry. So the survey captures the individual practitioner's perspective, so across functions, across the capital stack. We broke this into two categories of questions. So again, conditions, basically what people are seeing in the market right now, and sentiments, so what they either expect in the future and how confident they are, how they're feeling about it. So this was conducted between mid-October and early November and it gauged opinions in advance of the fourth quarter. So this is the second consecutive iteration of this survey. So we have a unique opportunity here to see how conditions and sentiments are changing across time. So we had 294 respondents from Canada across 54 firms, 97 responses from the U.S. across 51 different firms. And these were all types of organizations. So service providers, developers, private equity, REITs, investment managers, uh, a lot of different functional areas too. So appraisal, portfolio management, lending, brokerage. And so respondents were largely seasoned professionals in CRE. And so the average years of experience in the U.S. was 17 and, and 21 in Canada. So a lot of interesting stuff here. Omar, what were you seeing in some of your findings that were similar across North America in current conditions? Yeah. So when we're looking first at the conditions that came through in the survey results, the first area that I would highlight is the focus. So the current and primary focus for firms is really managing existing exposures. This was indicated by over half of the responses from both the U.S. and Canada, indicating that they are focused on managing their existing portfolio and exposures. And while managing existing exposures is the largest response, the next largest response that we saw was really focused on the earlier stages of the fund life cycle. So in the U.S., 7% of respondents noted that their focus is on capital raising, while in Canada, a similar 17% said that they were focused on deploying capital. Another area that I want to highlight in terms of current conditions and where we saw similarity between both the U.S. and Canada was in the responses of how survey participants characterize the current market in terms of competition. Across both countries, competition is still very much alive and well. The majority of responses from both the U.S. and Canada participants characterize the market as having balanced competition or with balance really referring to conditions where firms win some deals, they lose some deals, but ultimately aren't necessarily sacrificing deal economics or feel as though they are pushed out and not competing. Now, between 17 and 18 percent of survey respondents in both of the countries noted competition as being fierce. So this is characterized by conditions requiring a sacrifice of some deal economics to ultimately win the deal. Now, these percentages were generally in line from the prior quarter results, but there was a slight uptick in terms of how many responded with this fierce characterization. And it's probably reflective of the fact that the industry remains open for business, even though there's been significantly less transaction activity and just overall levels of activity in 2023. In the U.S., transaction activity, we know, is down over half compared to 2022. And while competition is still present, which is a good thing, no doubt, a more concerning signal from the survey was that respondents still are characterizing the market as being largely overpriced. In both countries, respondents characterized the major CRE food groups or property types as being overpriced. In the U.S., Alone, more than 50% of respondents characterized office, multifamily, industrial, and hospitality sectors as being overpriced. Meanwhile, in Canada, the overpriced characterization was greater than 50% for the same major food groups, as well as a few other areas that are bigger in Canada, including development. But one interesting thing to note here is that in both countries, retail 
was the only property type that had a majority response rate saying that it's fairly priced. Taking these considerations together, it, it really makes sense that amidst little transaction activity and overpricing, that competition would be fierce or there would be a greater level of competition. Also, the survey results showed that expectations for current portfolio conditions have soured or deteriorated modestly within North America and across both countries. As self-reported expectations have changed compared to 12 months ago, have really decreased in terms of the expectations around cash flow growth, whether that's for revenues and NOI, or have increased for capitalization rates, whether that's going in cap rates or cap rates at exit or the reversion of cap rates. So that paints a negative picture of how showing how these expectations have changed in the current market environment. One, I would say, a positive note is that the expectations for CapEx were largely stable in both the U.S. and Canada. And so a majority of respondents in both countries said that these were little changed or about the same as where they were 12 months ago. And then a major area of focus and a highly disruptive force throughout 2023 has been the cost of financing in interest rates. So we explored this more in the survey. Average all-in interest rates for CRE seen across markets as measured by the 10-year fixed rate financing averaged 7.3% in Canada and 8.2% in the US. And this is at an aggregated level and across property types, which we were able to break out in more detail. But there were major differences really seen across these property types. So not surprisingly, office was significantly higher in both countries. And while the average rates reported in the U.S. really showed little difference in terms of the cost of financing for both fixed and floating rate, Canadian results really showed cheaper financing for fixed rate products than for the floating rate products. Both countries really do seem to still have conservative underwriting in place, which is a good thing, as results from the survey showed that LTVs and DSC are still within an acceptable range. So LTVs were higher in Canada than they were in the U.S., but generally remained below the 70% threshold for industrial, office, retail, and were generally below 65% in the U.S. for nearly all property types financing terms. Now, reported DSCRs or debt service coverage ratios were also showing signs of conservatism still amongst lenders in financing terms. DSCRs remained above the 1.2x threshold for most property types, with the exception of multifamily in Canada and life science in the U.S. So overall, quality of credit standards really seems to be sound still, but this conservatism coupled with higher cost of financing and higher interest rate is absolutely something that's contributing to the difficulty in getting more deals done. And I'm sure is one of the main weights on overall investment activity. Hopping over to the forward-looking questions and results, a new question that we added to this quarter survey and one that we're going to be watching closely through future iterations of the survey, especially through 2024, is around the participants' expectations of the macroeconomy and recession expectations. First, we asked how likely a recession would be within the next six months. And for both countries, the U.S. and Canada, there was a vast majority that noted that they expect a recession to be likely. So expect a recession in Canada and 7% expect a recession in the next six months to be declared in the U.S. And so this is something that we'll watch play out it's through 2024. But results from the survey also showed that there was some differentiation across the different strategies that people identified as. But realistically, even though folks who identified as having an opportunistic fund strategy did have higher expectations for a recession. The fund strategies didn't differ too meaningfully, and many were still very much in line with aggregate experience and the aggregate results that do show that a recession is likely and expected to be, for the most part, shallow. 
And that's true for both the U.S. and Canada. Also, the results showed that a topic that's closely aligned to the probability or possibility of a recession is interest rates. The reason why these are closely tied together is because the overall business cycle often has a major impact on monetary policy, which often drives where interest rates are and ultimately where the cost of capital is. And so what we did here was we asked where we expect interest rates to be for commercial real estate in the coming 12 months. And in Canada, the results showed that expectations are that all in fixed rate financing for commercial real estate is expected to be in the mid six to low 7% range across Canada over the next 12 months. And this was a bit more elevated in the US where results showed expectations aligning right around that kind of like mid 7% rate for the US. So looking at expectations for cost of financing over the next year, results broken out by fund strategy show that there seems to be a consensus around these ranges for debt, but both regions showed differentiation for cost of equity capital. And we measured this by looking at the expected rate or net levered IRRs across strategies for the next 12 months. In both countries, the expected net IRRs ranged from around 10% being associated with the lower risk core strategies up to 16% for the higher risk opportunistic strategies. How investors and fund managers will hit those returns will be interesting though, because in both countries, the survey results show that there is a consensus expectation for decreased availability of capital, higher cap rates, increasing investor return expectations, as well as higher levels of CRE distress over the next 12 months. We surveyed these and more metrics along with the conviction associated with each metric and directional call for each of those metrics. But I'll spare that breakdown on this call and would encourage folks to see the actual survey results to dive into more detail on those expectations for the next 12 months. Across both countries, there was a notable increase in the percentage of respondents, noting that they expect the next 12 months to be more challenging. So the vast majority of respondents, which is 87% in Canada or 92% in the US, expect the next 12 months to be either somewhat or extremely challenging operating environments. These are notable increases from the prior quarter survey. And then finally, in terms of where the survey respondents said that they're going to be allocating more attention and more resources in the coming 12 months, financing remains a top priority, along with inflation and expense management. So overall, I'd say that these results were quite reflective of what we've been seeing play out really throughout 2023, whether that is via media or in the data and we're hearing from our clients and across the industry. I would say to summarize, conditions are currently rough and expectations suggest that things may pick up and may get better in terms of activity going forward, but that there are still many clouds that remain in the 2024 forecast. And while there are many areas of similarity between the US and Canada, there are also many notable differences. Cole, what were some of those differences that you saw and that jumped out? Yeah, so I have kind of a quick note on one difference that showed up to me. So one of the questions we asked was what your intention was for transacting. A super majority, to borrow a political term, in each country are looking to transact next year. When you break this out by exposure to CRE, so we measure that in AUM, these big players or those with above 5 billion in exposure to CRE versus small measured as having less than 500 million in exposure. So the big are going to be net sellers and the small will be net buyers, which I think tracks with a lot of what we're seeing. We're starting to digest this new higher rate environment. Transactions may be picking up, but it's really going to be the big selling to the small who have been raising capital all this time. 
But where's the difference between the two countries? Four fifths are planning on transacting in the US, but only two thirds in Canada. Now, this was uniform actually across firms of, of all sizes. So really interesting stuff there. What were you seeing? Uh, any differences in availability of capital? I know this is all intertwined. So yeah, there were some quite noticeable differences between expectations for availability of capital over the next 12 months across the US and Canada. So first, on the equity side of the capital stack, one thing that jumped out to me was that for both countries, the results showed that equity capital is expected to be more available from some of those more nimble sources, including funds, high net worth individuals, and family offices, while being a bit more constrained or less available from, I would say, the more traditional and institutional players, including asset managers and REITs. And expectations for debt capital availability significantly across the countries, with the U.S. responses really revealing the biggest expected lender pullback being from the banks. This expected pullback was really not seen in the Canada data. And this is likely because the Canadian banking sector wasn't as affected, if not affected at all, by the same drama that really rocked the U.S. regional banks earlier this year. However, both countries did also show a, a notable decline in the expected capital availability from lenders reliant on capital market execution. So this includes both the mortgage REITs as well as the CMBS issuers. However, on a, a brighter note, there was similar expectations across both U.S. and Canada responses that debt funds will become more active and provide greater capital availability in the next 12 months. This is something that I know that the media has been picking up on and covering lately. But Cole, were there any regional differences that caught your attention that you'd call out to listeners in terms of priorities? Yeah. So one of the things that we asked folks to weigh in on in the current and immediate past iteration of the survey, we asked folks to tell us which issues they expect to be a top priority within the next 12 months. I mean, so there were some common themes that emerged across all North American respondents. So they're still largely concerned about property specific and finance specific concerns. So cost of capital, inflation, rising operating expenses, development costs, and leasing and tenant retention. So some of the things that we saw dominate the top of the list last time. However, these did moderate from one survey to the other, again, as some CRE stakeholders digest the new interest rate environment. And so some of these concerns did moderate quite a bit. However, in the U.S., unlike in Canada, there was a huge shift towards what we'll refer to as exogenous political risks to real estate. So the U.S. survey actually revealed a more than 5% shift in respondents noting federal and state budget concerns as a top priority within the next 12 months along with zoning reform, and then more than 10% shift in those noting housing cost and availability, and a more than 15% point shift in those mentioning geopolitical risk and international relations. And that theme there to me is that all these have a political or regulatory tint to them. And the, those shifts were really seen in America where they weren't seen in Canada. So I think that this does add up when you consider a lot of the things that occurred during the third quarter. So on the international front, we did reach the 18 month mark of the Ukraine Russia war back in September. Hamas attacked Israel in early October and throughout quarter three, China's property sector really plunged into chaos as some of its larger developers began defaulting on bonds. It's once largest developers, so that country garden seems to be now on the brink as well. They're worried about making their debt payments. On the domestic front in the U.S., you had a contentious budget fight in Congress. We have narrowly averted a shutdown, but in doing so, uh, that resulted in the ouster of the House Speaker, Kevin McCarthy. Moody's and Fitch downgraded the U.S. credit rating as the U.S. kind of seems to continue this vicious cycle. Getting to the brink of shutting the government down, interest payments continue to skyrocket on debt, and the ratings agencies seem to be worried that eventually something's going to have to give to avoid a U.S. default effectively. So lastly, one of the things that I think is definitely tied to this sort of political regulatory angle 
So housing cost and availability shot up as a concern. And so 30-year fixed mortgage rate is still averaging above 7%. We saw the Freddie Mac affordability index is at its lowest in years, so the least affordable in years. And you've seen a lot of conversations, even just anecdotally, about this sort of shift in the U.S. used to be really focused on how to prop up demand. And now I think the conversation has begun to shift towards accelerating growth in the housing supply. And so one of those issues we saw pop up with more than a 5% shift of quarter over quarter was land use restrictions or, or zoning laws. So removing barriers to growth in both the housing supply and even other commercial property types. So a lot of political movement, the U.S. seems to be at a political stalemate. And that is really showing up in U.S. CRE stakeholders' opinions on what they're focused on in the next 12 months. So I think as we continue to talk about this more or we write some more insights about this stuff, we might break this down by the type of respondents, right? If you're more senior, are you focused on different things than more junior respondents? A lot of different ways we could chop this up. But again, the difference here, the U.S. seems a lot more focused on some of these political and regulatory issues. Canadian respondents largely still similar responses quarter on quarter to what they're focused on the property and financing level. So super interesting stuff. But I know there's a lot more that people can dig into on their own. Do you want to tell us about how folks can access these? Yeah, I think the easiest way would be to see the link in the show notes. Otherwise, you can find this survey and past survey results on the Altus site or simply by searching Altus CRE Conditions and Sentiment Survey in your browser. The link will ultimately take you to the survey homepage where you can find past survey results and sign up to participate in the future surveys. Because this is a quarterly survey open to all CRE practitioners, I highly encourage you to participate because your contribution will make the findings more robust and more useful and hopefully more insightful to you. Omar, I know we'll cover some more on this in some future episodes and as we continue to iterate the survey, but I think that is all the time we've got today. And I look forward to speaking with you on another episode. Have a good one.